everyone, and thanks for joining me on another episode of the Seamless Connection podcast. I have with me today Dr. Stephanie Lahr, and I'm thrilled to have her talk about all things of virtual nursing. She's had an amazing career at a number of different hospital systems and now at startups, and she's got a wealth of experience to share with us. Dr. Lahr, uh, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, really excited to be here and have this conversation. Um, for those that don't know you, uh, can you share a little bit of your background and what actually brought you to healthcare? I know everyone's got a healthcare story, um, whether it's something that inspired them to get into it. And you have it from both sides. You're on the business side of things now, but you were also a practicing physician before. So I'm wondering if there was two different inspirations that kind of changed your pathway a little bit. Yeah, probably so. So, you know, when I think about what got me to the point of medical school and, and wanting a career in healthcare and in medicine, that one is a little blurrier for me. I kind of like, I don't, I feel like that's always what I wanted to do. My parents do tell me that there was a point where I wanted to be an astronaut um, and a lawyer. Um, they also remind me that when I was a freshman in high school, I immediately tried to refuse to do the frog dissection out of some, I don't know <laughs> what, um, what was, what was behind that. But I don't really remember a time that I wasn't thinking that healthcare was where I wanted to be. My parents were not physicians. My I grew up on a cattle ranch, and then later my parents uh -huh. went to college um, and became an engineer and accountant. Um, so it wasn't a familial really kind of thing. It just was kind of a calling. Um, and then I, you know, I, I went to medical school um, on the Texas Gulf Coast, where I actually happen to be visiting right now, and. Um, I uh, I thought that I was at an academic medical center here at UT, University of Texas in Galveston, and I, I thought really I would spend my career here. I loved academics. I loved teaching, um, and um, I, I had a sort of interesting early experience in residency. I, I started off in OBGYN, and mm -hmm. there were lots of pieces of it that I really loved, um, but then there were some elements of it that I just wasn't sure fit the career path I wanted to have. So I'm one of those rare sort of weird situations where I switched residencies um, oh. partway through and went from um, OBGYN to internal medicine. So can be done, um, was <laughs> a little bit tricky, but uh, was able to do that. And then um, actually what happened was I, I was finishing my residency here in Galveston and we had a huge hurricane. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had recently gone through the EMR uh, migration. And this was a hot minute ago. It was you know, <laughs> earlier in the um, in the realm of, of EMR deployments. And so I had all the bumps and bruises that residents at the time had from trying to get those things deployed. Um, but then we had this big hurricane and amazingly and miraculously within a really short period of time from a very devastating hurricane. And when I like my own home had five feet of water, um, oh. the Galveston Island itself was uninhabitable for several months. The university closed all of the infrastructure down on the island for months, but we were um, quickly setting up opportunities for patients to be able to interact with us either virtually or at satellite clinics. And um, I, because I was almost done with my residency, I was set up in a clinic to start working with patients and I was able to see everything that had happened right in their course of their recent hospitalizations, recent clinic visits. And this is at a time when for patients, things can be really, really trying, right? Their, their medical um, situations obviously sometimes go out of control during a high stress situation like that. They don't have access to their medications, all kinds of things. And it was very powerful to me, this idea that, you know, 10 months before that, if this had happened, all of that paper was literally underwater and I would have had no ability to have any insight into what was going on with them. And yet with a, a computer, a fax machine and a telephone, I was able to see what was going on. I was able to e-prescribe medications. I was able to send documents to you know other areas of care where they might be able to get care temporarily. So that was a powerful turning point for me that said, okay, this technology infusion into how we practice medicine is necessary. It's where we have to be going. It, it's the future. Um, and so we, we left the area and I went into private practice as a hospitalist um, back in the north in Idaho, where I, I grew up in Montana. 
So we, I, I, my husband and I joke, we moved out of hurricane territory and as far away from where we could do that as possible. So Idaho, Montana, those are good places to avoid a hurricane. So um, I got involved, you know, at the hospital with the leadership team. And I remember I was interviewing with the CEO of the health system um, and he was asking me you know, about different things that were important to me. And I said, well, actually, what do you, what, do you have an EMR? Like, what, what's your strategy there? And he kind of looked at me and was like, do you want to use the EMR? And I said, yeah, I, I think that's, you know, where this is all going. And he's like, well, I have to tell you, you're like the first doctor ever who's told me they wanted to use an EMR. Um, and so that's great. We do have one. We're getting ready to make a big change. We'd love to have your involvement. And that just sort of catapulted me into this opportunity to get involved with the health system around integrating technology. And then I found out that there was actually a whole pathway in medicine around, um, you know, being able to do that. And I got, so then I went, started down that path and got board certified in clinical informatics. And, um, and really it just kind of was a, a serendipity of, uh, of different, um, you know, pieces in my life that came together. And the more I did with it, the more two things were um, apparent to me. One, I really loved learning about the technology side. I was um, a CMIO that was more, I wasn't techie at home. I mean, I, again, another joke at my house was if the internet went out, it was my husband's job to fix it. That was not my role. Um, but thinking about the deeper connection, connection of, of technology and how that came into medicine. And I loved being that bridge for my other clinical partners, right? Whether that was, you know, my own hospitalist partners or emergency room physicians or nurses or care managers, really helping them articulate what their needs were and figuring out how to translate that was exciting for me and something I enjoyed learning and pushing myself toward. And the other piece I identified was it was critical to have someone in that space that spoke both of those languages that could bring um, all of this together so that we could move things forward. And so more and more in my career, I started then backing off on clinical practice and moving further into um, really that intersection of, of health IT, was a CMIO um, at an organization uh, when I was at Monument Health, um, went there for an EMR deployment, and then uh, shortly after we went live, the CEO of the health system, our, our CIO was, was retiring. And he said, gosh, it seems like maybe having a physician at the helm of thinking through and, and leading our technology teams and making sure the alignment is there with how those needs need to be met makes sense. Would you be willing to be the CIO? And I said, <laughs> yes, I would love to do that. And so, um, you know, again, jumped in with, with both feet and continued working on education and learning and, and surrounding myself with a really great team um, because there were certainly elements on the technology stack side that I knew some about but wasn't an expert in. And, and loved that, again, really now even broader opportunity beyond informatics, but even thinking about like, how does the network, how does our, um, our technical infrastructure in the data center impact the performance of the elements and tools that our clinical teams need? Um, and then I kind of developed a reputation for, hey, let's push let's push further, let's push faster, let's go forward. Um, and so got introduced to a lot of different companies who were pushing the envelope in healthcare and got introduced to Artisite um, a few years ago, a, a company that was founded by another physician. And you know his goal was to think about ways that we could reduce the friction and take work off of clinicians and allow them to get back to providing the bedside and clinical care that they were trained to do and allow some of the other tasks that needed to be done to be automated and, and um, off, of, off of their plates. And so I was very excited about how he was thinking about doing that with computer vision and other IoT sensor tools. And um, at one point he said to me, you're my lowest paid, meaning I wasn't working for him, uh, most highly effective salesperson, right? Because every everybody I talked to, I thought you, you need to hear about where technology could take us beyond where we are today. I felt for so long, especially in my CMIO days, you know, that my job was to make it suck less. And <laughs> while that, I mean, it, it was, it was a, a worthy cause it was not really like you don't put that on a billboard. Um, and so 
we, I was starting to see when I, when I met with the artist site team, this opportunity for this doesn't, this doesn't need to be terrible. This, this yeah. technology can really help us and move us to the future. And so I decided to make then another leap and move from the provider side into the, the vendor side and, and put my full effort into really how we think about reducing the friction and bringing the joy back to medicine through the use of advanced, advanced technologies and um, AI and, and IoT. No, that's amazing. And that's such a interesting journey with so many twists and turns, but it's also so logical. Like it's, uh, I'm not wondering how did you end up here with that yeah. background? It's, it's, it's so cool. Um, so let's talk about nurses, right? You, we yeah. know that nurses are the key to successful hospitalizations. They play an essential role in every step of the patient's journey. And I'm sure you've seen that in your, when you're practicing as a hospitalist, I'm sure you see it now running, running Artisite. Um, what role does AI play in nursing specifically? And where do you see the biggest changes happening over the next few years? Yeah, I think, you know, nurses um, more than probably anyone else in our sort of clinical ecosystem, um, they end up being the doers of all the things, right? When in a hospital, when the transporter is not available, the nurse gets asked to do it. When the, um, you know, when the phlebotomist isn't available, the nurse gets asked to do it. When this piece of documentation needs to get done, well, we can get the nurse to do it. Like when this box needs to be checked because we need one more piece of information, the nurse has to do it. And it's become over time untenable, right? Our, our nurses need to be, they're, they're becoming, they're trained in clinical bedside care and yet over time, they've become the people that we ask to pick up the slack for any other part of the health system that can't meet the need at the moment. And I think that is driving a lot of burnout in nursing. And it's also eroding that sort of true um, heart of what nursing care is. And a lot of the things that we ask nurses to take on because they are physically there and at the bedside are things that don't require a nurse, and in many cases, don't require a human to do them at all, if we would be smarter about how we leverage technology. And so I think when we think about artificial intelligence in the hospital, the way we think about it is how do we drive the elements that nurses are being asked to do today that really have nothing to do with nursing yeah. And have them have to do with them being available and at the bedside and drive that out and drive that into automation and allow them to focus back on the care of the patient. So that could be anything from using artificial intelligence um, with with language and, um, you know, NLP to automate documentation. Um, it could be using computer vision to see and understand what's happening in the room and how the nurse is interacting or what may be happening with the patient and cueing the next piece that needs to occur um, in, in the care process. Um, again, it could be things where we just wanted to know one more piece of information when a certain thing happens. And instead of saying, oh, well, you're in the room, check the box, no. we check the box. And that can be in the in the patient room that can be in the operating room that can be in the clinic but we see you know and again nursing more than anybody um so many administrative and other kinds of tasks being put on the shoulders of our clinicians that really don't need to be there and and advanced ai with the use of iot sensors that can capture that information can allow us to start to remove that layer, those layers of burden. And it will happen in a sequential process. We'll remove them sort of little by little. But if we start now, it, you know, it's, it's very similar to the whole concept around uh, autonomous cars. Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of places right now where the cars are truly driving themselves, but because the goal has been to try and get to some of the pieces of the car driving itself being automated, we've advanced what the car can do to assist. And that's really where we want to focus at Artisite is how do we augment all of our clinicians, but first and foremost nurses, to allow them to be able to focus on the pieces that they're trained to do as nurses, that they want to do as nurses, and reduce that other friction. 
No, and that makes complete sense. Um, when you talked before about the role that humans play in developing the AI, I'd love to know how you're using frontline nurses in the information loop to train your systems. Yeah. So I think, again, using the example of, um, of self-driving cars, because it's when we think about computer vision, which is something that we use um, significantly at Artisite to help, because foundationally for us, a clinician in the room, whether it's a nurse or a pharmacist or a physician, they, they use their senses, right? We see, we hear and speak, we know where things are in space. So as a premise at Artisite, our concept was if we're going to automate work for those clinicians and really make their lives better, we have to be able to mimic some of their senses. Otherwise, this is not going to be sophisticated enough to really support them. So we need to be able to see and hear and speak and those kinds of pieces. So we have cameras in the room. We have speaker microphones in the room. We can leverage ultra wideband or other uh, RTLS technologies to know where things are in space. And then we can assimilate information from that and train algorithms to be detecting different elements. When you think about a self-driving car, if I said to you, okay, in order to, to develop self-driving cars, we're going to take some cars, we're going to put them in a, in a track, a fake environment uh, on a set with a track, and we're going to teach them how to drive in this artificial environment. And then we're going to let those cars go drive in Las Vegas. You would say, I'm going to not be in Las Vegas when you move those cars from the fake environment to the real environment, because you know inherently the real environment is so much more complicated. And right. if then I went and said, well, we've trained it in Las Vegas, um, but we're going to let it drive in London. <laughs> you again would say, mm, I'm going to avoid being on the streets of London because there's many differences in London related to driving that there are you know, in Las Vegas. If we're going to use that same kind of conceptual framework in healthcare, we have to be building algorithms built in the environment around the work that actually happens. It can't be artificial. And so if we have a virtual nursing platform where we have a virtual nurse on a computer or on a TV screen, a bedside nurse at the bedside, a patient in the room, and they're having a meaningful interaction to care for the patient, delivering value in that moment, we can leverage that interaction to train algorithms to understand what it's seeing. Because in computer vision in particular, when you're training that artificial intelligence, it has to have some direction. It doesn't automatically know what it looks like to put an IV in someone's arm. Somebody has to tell the computer, this is what it looks like. And then we have to show it to the computer a hundred different ways so that it would say, oh, that's, you know, it, this, it could be in an arm, it could be in a wrist, it could be in a neck, it could be in a leg. The best people to help the computer understand what it's seeing and make sense of that are the people who really live and do the work. So we have the system built such that if you're using our system to provide virtual care, that is the seamless workflow of that interaction. In the background, we leverage that information to begin to train algorithms to see and understand and hear what's going on so that then in the future, after we've seen enough of a certain thing happen, we could say, what if we just automated that? What if you didn't have to say anymore that you um, put a, an IV in and then we would take that voice activated information and put it into the EMR? we could get to a point where we see that that happens and the documentation is there and then you go in and you just validate it, right? So again, those are the sequences over time. It starts off with easier pieces of, you know, creating this collaborative environment. Then we build on that with simple algorithms like voice um, to text that can be documentation. And then we build further on that to use computer vision to see and sense it and then drive the documentation. Um, and there are so many steps and layers in that, as you pointed out, I think that self-driving car is such a great analogy just because of that. There's, you gotta take those baby steps and walk before you run. Um, right. 
switching gears a little bit uh, and focusing more on the nurses, um, I know you're a big proponent, as are we at Amplify MD, in leveraging technology to bring the joy back to practicing medicine. But there still seem to be more examples of technology creating an added burden on our future frontline providers. Um, I'd love to hear about some real life examples of how AI and Artsite is making nursing more enjoyable for the ones actually living that experience day to day. Can you share a few? Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I, I think it's a combination. First, I would say virtual nursing in and of itself, not leveraging artificial intelligence, but changing that care model mm -hmm. and partnering a bedside nurse with a virtual nurse is actually making huge strides toward bringing some of that joy back to the practice of nursing by separating the elements. Because again, part of the challenge has been up until this point that when you're trying to focus on the patient and you're also trying to focus on all the administrative tasks, you can't do them both well. And so then you're left to making a decision around, am I focusing more on this part or am I focusing more on this part? And do I have enough time at the end of the day to really do all of those things? So the first thing I think that we're seeing right now is breaking some of those, um, the, that workflow into pieces that allows a virtual nurse to focus on certain elements of education, documentation, things that you don't need to be in the room to do or that they can support the bedside nurse allows then the bedside nurse to focus on the things in the room and with the patient in real time and a conversation while perhaps the virtual nurse is doing the documentation. So just changing the work there, we've seen tremendous um, improvements in, um, in uh, the, for example, nurses uh, and the satisfaction reduction in nursing turnover um, and, and increases in nursing retention at organizations that have rolled out virtual nursing programs, even without the artificial intelligence, because it's a different way to transform the care so that people can focus on one part of the care delivery at a time. When we think about then layering further in um, the technology, so I'll use an example. One of the health systems that we worked with, they wanted to build an algorithm around um, um, pressure ulcer prevention. Mm -hmm. And because as we know, certain you know critically ill patients in particular need to be moved and turned. It's something that we then need to be documenting and keeping track of. It has to be done at a certain cadence. Um, and when you're responsible for a whole bunch of things, that can the two hours between that turn and the next turn can go by very quickly. And so we worked with one of our health systems to build an algorithm so that one, we can detect if the patient is making a turn. And then two, if they haven't, that we can communicate with the team to go in and do that. So it's those kind of just little offloads of things that allow the nurses to say, this technology is supporting making sure that I remember to do the things that I needed to do, or if it's already happened, getting that documentation done for me, getting that communicated to the next person in the care team so that I don't have to do it. Um, similarly, in the operating room, um, we have an algorithm that can detect when the patient enters into the operating room. A circulating nurse in an OR is running around doing so many different things, very similar, right, to the bedside nurse that's in the patient room, they're being asked to do all the little things that might not otherwise be getting done. Just the idea that we can see that that patient came in the room, we'll automate that documentation and allow you to not have to run over to the computer to click that box. And you can instead focus on allowing the patient to get comfortably transitioned from, you know, from the bed that they're being brought in to the OR table and that their transition into the operating room is smooth. It's little things like that, just chipping away at those that we've seen really are allowing nurses to say, again, to your point earlier, this technology is working for me and with me, not adding something. Um, the last example that I'll give is, you know, it's, it's difficult to know right now that we're at a time when our nurses in particular, lots of our clinicians, but in particular nurses are in some cases taking 
their own, their own lives are at risk at times in our clinical environments. We see attacks, physical uh, violent attacks on staff. And uh, one of the things that we've built an algorithm around is, again, if we already have this infrastructure in the patient rooms and we know that the nurse is in the room and what's happening, um, a quick and easy way that doesn't, it's, doesn't require activation of any device, it doesn't require anything on the wall, that a nurse could activate um, a request for somebody to come in and help them because they feel unsafe. The other piece is because we've got cameras in these rooms and we've created this virtual um, uh, opportunity for, for virtual nursing, the virtual nurses also have extra eyes into the room and are able to see an escalating situation. So we've had several scenarios where um, potentially violent um, concerns uh, for a staff member have been um, either prevented or quickly um, addressed because our technology was there for those teams to be able to escalate you know, their concern and know that somebody w was watching over them. Sort of tangentially, we had a story about a very, a new nurse who just was, and this, this really wasn't about AI, but it was again, just about the use of the technology and the camera in the room and having a virtual partner. She was going into a room with a patient um, that she d was just a little bit nervous about. It was an older gentleman um, and he was demented and so therefore sometimes did things that were a, a little bit unpredictable. Um, and she just wanted an extra set of eyes. So she asked the virtual nurse, hey, when I go in this room, could you just watch while I'm in there? Nothing happened. Everything was totally fine. But it made her feel so much better about what she needed to go in the room and do and, and about her own safety um, that she, you know, she then self-reported how, what an impact that had on her ability to continue to grow and learn and want to be a nurse because she had this technology and support of her virtual nursing partner um, that were providing that security blanket to her in a, in a situation where she just wasn't quite certain. And that's amazing, especially because, as you pointed out, they they are on the front lines and they are risking it all, not just from diseases like COVID, but actual physical, you know, threats and harm. Um, yeah. And I love hearing about new care models like this on the Seamless Connection. That's why I have the podcast. But in general, though, the people that you and I work with, uh, the health systems are very risk averse, and you know this from your own past experience. I know, yeah. um, and they tend to hang on to legacy solutions, or they tend to want to prefer to be a follower than the leader, especially in some cutting edge things like this, um, yeah. which is understandable, right? They're dealing with human lives, and it's a huge Absolutely. cost too. So, um, how do you think health systems can be confident? investing in new technology, platforms, AI, virtual care solutions, a whole kit and caboodle without knowing if they'll be around in five years or with having the confidence to, um, to spend the money it takes today to get the returns in, you know, X, Y, Z months, maybe even years down the line. Yeah. I, I mean, there, there's several pieces I think to dig into there. One is, I, I think there does have to be a realization at health systems that when we're talking about care model transformation, um, it doesn't stop with just the model transformation. It needs to flow into payment transformation. It needs to flow into, you know, we have to really reinvent everything that we're doing. We can't just ask our clinicians to rethink how they're doing things and not ask the CFO to rethink how they think about how we pay for things and how things are budgeted for that. I will say one of the challenges that we see it or in organizations who are actually very excited to embrace some of these new models is that we're stuck in an old paradigm, particularly when it comes to things like virtual nursing or virtual therapies or um, the, the, when we think about physicians doing virtual care, it's different because we have RVUs, we have ways to be able to capture what the cost and, and to drive revenue from that. When our support teams, our nurses, our pharmacists, our, our therapists are delivering care, they're part of a bundled package, right? Whether it's a part of a DRG or however that's being done. So the model of how 
nurses and and units budget for the nurses that they're using and the resources that they're using we're going to have to rethink that some because if you're going to have a virtual nursing hub that's providing care to a large distributed geography well you can't charge that particular nurse to this particular cost center because it's not really that cost center right and so there's going to have to be this overarching i think review of how we think about transforming it has to go beyond the clinicians thinking about transformation everybody needs to be thinking about the transformation when we bring it back to the technology and the technology investment piece i think there's a couple of things steps that organizations can take um one of those would be you have to dig in, especially on new technologies, especially when we're talking about things like artificial intelligence. Almost every company today that sells any kind of software will say that they're doing something with AI. It's become the buzzword. Um, you have to have enough depth of knowledge uh, within the health system to ask the hard questions. Some of what we were just talking about, how do you train your algorithms? How do you validate algorithms? How do you make sure that those algorithms work at one organization just as well as they work at another organization? What information and data can you show to me that will demonstrate that these algorithms will be effective in my own environment? Um, so that diligence, I think, is really important. And for companies that pass your diligence test, well, the likelihood is they're more likely to be around longer because they're doing something that's real. I do think that that we'll see over the next few years a consolidation of you know different tools, whether it's clinical decision support tools, whether it's process improvement tools. But the consolidation doesn't hurt health system organizations as long as the tools remain in place, right? Mm -hmm. There's lots of tools, great tools that have been acquired by a bigger organization that you can continue to use, and we see them actually improve. Um, you know, I'll, I'll use Nuance as an example. The work that they've done um, as they have been acquired by Microsoft to further advance their their tools around language, you know, and, and capturing documentation has been great. So acquisition of these companies isn't a bad thing if their underlying tech is great. So organizations doing diligence on making sure that what they're being sold can actually be delivered, I think, is first. The next thing I would say is in the space of virtual care in particular, there has to be hardware agnostic uh, approach. We can't say that the camera and the speaker and the two-way video and those elements that are going to be in the room should can be sold by the company that's going to deliver the software. Because what if over time there's something that you want to do as an organization that that software company doesn't do? but now you can't do it because their hardware won't accommodate it, right? A, a camera and a speaker, I think every health system in the country is gonna have a camera and a speaker microphone in every patient room in the next three to five years. And I highly recommend that those be agnostic, as agnostic as possible, so that if you do make a change in who you're partnering with, that technology, that infrastructure piece that you've made an investment in doesn't have to change with it. Or if there's something new you want to add on, you're not thinking, oh, now I have to have three cameras in the room. No, you should be able yeah. to use one and you should be able to dictate how that works because it's agnostic. And then the final thing I would say is as a part of diligence, you need to be thinking about companies that are have a growth mindset, that what we're doing today is not all we're ever going to do and where we're going. It's what we're doing today. And we're constantly thinking about how does the foundation of the technology team at a company like Artisite or any other of our you know, uh, people that are out there, the technology team that they've built and their capabilities, how is that allowing them to do what they're doing today, but also to be thinking about and what are they thinking about, about where things are going to go in the future, because things are going to be moving so quickly that companies with a growth mindset, they're thinking, yes, we love what we're doing today, but we're constantly also thinking about what we can do tomorrow is going to mean that they're much more likely to maintain through the test of time.
And that's a fantastic answer because that's that's exactly true. No one's going to be able to anticipate all the needs today. No one's going to be able to figure out where all the tech is going. If you imagine dating myself here, but I grew up without a phone in high school, right? And now I couldn't imagine life without my phone today. So um, it it's it's shocking how quickly hardware can become obsolete, but amazing how technological advances, hardware plus software plus what have you, can completely change how you live your day-to-day -day or practice medicine day-to-day. -day. Exactly. What would you say um, are, would be the two to three biggest barriers though for hospitals and health systems trying to shift to these new care delivery models? Because I think as, as you point out, we're at a tipping point, right? These health systems have to make that decision. They have to have that foresight or they're going to get left behind. Um, and they're under tremendous pressures to tremendous pressure to reduce costs without compromising care. Um, so if you kind of think about the two or three biggest barriers for them, even if they're willing to do it, like how yeah. can they cross that final hurdle to, to make that pull that trigger? Yeah. I, I mean, I think we, we've touched on it some already, which is one that, um, because of the financial pressures everyone is under right now, people want an ROI that is very quick. Yeah. And the reality is care transformation that's not quick. Um, it, it can be it can be immediately transformative when you've done it, um, but it takes time to do it. It's not um, it's not you don't big bang go live care transformation, right? Mm -hmm. It's um, it's not a, a flip of a switch. And so I, I do think it's figuring out. It, so it's hard for organizations right now to figure out how to be thinking about, you know, investments that they know they need to make um, when the ROI probably really is two to three years down the road. Um, I, I think a way to look at addressing that is when you think about solutions, think about platforms that can solve a whole bunch of problems so that at least if you make an investment now, and you can see what that ROI, like you can identify the ROI that you can get the quickest and start working on that. Once you own that platform, now you can accelerate that process mm -hmm. and do a whole lot more things with it. So um, I think getting that initial, identifying the first best problem that can get people the ROI as quickly as possible so that then that investment can take hold and people believe in it, but doing it with a platform that then allows for that to be continually, you know, sort of accelerated and then driven over time um, it is something that's really important. So the barrier is that kind of challenge to ROI. I think the solution is identify the first best problem that gets you an ROI as quickly as you can and choose a partner that can solve more than one problem. So that mm -hmm. as you start to assimilate and acquire some of the initial ROI returns, you can continue to then do new and great things with it. Um, change management is always going to be one of our challenges. Um, and I, I, that's human nature, right? It's we were tied to the things that we've done because we've invested in them. Um, and even those of us who, you know, may be seen as people who embrace and run toward change, um, there are still times that, you know, that there's that inclination to say, oh, we, maybe we just want to stay. Um, I think there just has to be an acknowledgement of that. And then within an organization, typically speaking, if the solution and the problem you're trying to solve is meaningful and important, and that's probably a big piece here is solve a problem that's real, right? Not every problem at every, every organization has a slightly different variation of similar problems. And so identifying in your own organization, what's the problem that you want to solve. And then once you've done that, typically speaking, if it is a problem that really needs to be solved in your organization, there's going to be a cohort of people that are excited and willing to take some risk. So do it in that group first, right? And and then accelerate their experience and, and move with that over time. I think in healthcare, you know, to some of the point that you were making earlier, lives are at stake. So in the technology world, when people talk about, you know, um, failing fast 
and having this very, you know, iterative um, learning approach, agile approach to to software development. And we think about bringing that into healthcare. There's an initial bristling of like fail. Like, <laughs> there's no failure in healthcare, right? There, and so we have to think about that differently. Failure doesn't have to mean somebody's life is threatened. Failure can mean something more along the lines of that was just not as successful as we wanted it to be. Let's pivot and move to the next. So I, I do think we have to have um, a, a mindset toward this idea of accepting some some failure tolerance, but but thinking about it in a way that it, again we it doesn't we don't have to be risking patient lives to do. Um, iterative growth and and learning we can do it in ways that are smaller than that um and then you know i think the last thing is generally speaking um finances whether it's roi or not right we know that the financial challenges are there and so again i think it's it's really just figuring out what can you do mm -hmm. where can you start um, and maybe that means starting small, but starting small is starting somewhere. And then as you prove out the success, then the dollars will follow. The reality is we can't keep doing things the way we've been doing them. Right. It's not sustainable. We have to change. Um, it is going to cost money from the standpoint of all different kinds of investments that are going to need to be made. Um, but the there is no real alternative to that because the numbers would say it's untenable to move into the future so i think that is a you know that's that's a problem that we're actually in some ways it, it it's good to have because it's that burning platform that says you can't just stay where we are yeah. we have to move forward and then just figuring out how to do that yeah, this has been such a fascinating conversation and thinking about how there are so many innovative ways to improve healthcare. I think especially those last few comments that you made in terms of how do we concretely move forward when the resources might not be there and everyone's resource constrained. Um, that was really interesting and, and a good viewpoint from someone who's been on both sides of that equation in terms yeah. of yeah. both wanting it and right. to get it out there, right? So, right. Um, as we wrap up, because I know we're coming up on time, can you share one specific innovation in AI for healthcare that you were the most excited about or that you believe will have the most dramatic impact on patient care in the next few years? Yeah, I um, I don't want this to sound contrived because it is the work that we are doing. But honestly, it's probably why I ended up at Artisite, which when you break the word down into artificial and site, we do a lot more than just computer vision. Um, but to me, computer vision is, I think, has a real opportunity to be very game changing in so many different parts of healthcare, whether that's things like using computer vision for in the revenue cycle side to be looking at, you know, documents that are coming in, whether that's using computer vision at a loading dock to be able to see what packages are coming in, reading codes and figuring out where those things need to go. Um, and then on the clinical side, again, some of the examples that I already mentioned of seeing and learning and understanding what's happening and then being able to bring automation. We, when we, when I was at, when I was at my own health system, when I was at Monument and we were talking about kind of the ways, um, the challenges across different areas again everything from the loading dock to the revenue cycle team to the clinical bedside team none of them had the resources they needed with human capital to do the amount of work that was being asked of them and in a lot of cases the work that was being asked of them there was a layer of that work that was not enjoyable to the person doing the work and didn't require the human mind really to to be fully engaged in order to do it those are great opportunities for AI, but in particular, I, the things I think about around computer vision to be able to say, OK, well, what if, you know, if we could see all of these things coming off the dock and know 
that this and read all of those scans, then it's not about eliminating team members because that's really, we've not been at a place in healthcare where there's a surplus of people <laughs> for a really long time. Yeah. The place that we are at is everybody is being asked to do three people's jobs. Yeah. And automation in general is going to allow us to get to a point where one person can do what was formerly three people's job and actually feel good about the quality of the work that they're doing and not feel overburdened and burned out by the amount of work that that takes. But I think computer vision coming in to that ecosystem, in addition to large language models um, and some of the other elements of, of AI that we're seeing really take off right now, is going to be a game changer, an added layer of sophistication that we can bring in in a number of environments um, that really, I think, is going to, um, to make, uh, transform uh, how, how we're doing a lot of our work. No, that's super fascinating. I can't wait to see where the next few years take us. I have a feeling it's going to be exactly like the iPhone where it was like this novelty and everyone's like, there's no way I would pay $1,000 for a phone. And now it's like, I can't live without it. So, Yes. My daughter's phone broke while we were on vacation and she's been living for the moment that they are <laughs> delivering her replacement phone, right? And she's 14 and a half. She doesn't really need it, but she needs it, right? We, 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 we can't, we, we really don't, but you know, know how to function without them. And yeah, I, I think, and that's what I want to see in healthcare. Like I want to see us get to the point where we see technology as that thing that we want right next to us, mm -hmm. helping and getting that job done. Like we do the smartphone and, you know, the laptop and, and those kinds of things that we're like, gosh, I, I don't know how I would have done it without this. Um, because that's that's been the missing link. We've added a lot of technology into healthcare, but it's never been done in a way that makes people feel truly. There's a few cases like robotic surgery. I think is has been a great example of surgeons that embrace it, really feeling like it elevates and makes them better surgeons and able to do things that they wouldn't be able to do without that robot. We need to take that kind of experience and bring it into other areas of healthcare so that people are excited when they show up at work that day for that technology to be their partner throughout the day to get the work done that they need to get done. Yep. No, 100%. Well, Dr. Laura, thank you so much for sharing your afternoon with me. I can't wait to see what comes next for you and for Artisite and, um, and for the hospitals that are making these big strides in new care delivery models and innovations that, that they bring with. Thank yeah, you. really appreciate the opportunity to share and talk with you today. Mm -hmm.